Hello and welcome to the Inspiring Mind series. My name is Michael Poth. In its mission to promote the application of psychoanalytic principles to contemporary social issues, the Carter Jenkins Center is pleased to present the first installment of the Inspiring Mind series. Inspiring Minds is a program series designed to explore the nature of creativity and its role in a wide range of professional environments. We hope through the series to better understand the relationship between creativity and the personal challenges and conflicts that both interfere with and provide the impetus for innovation. Inspiring Minds features the work of individuals who have made significant contributions in their particular fields and explores the motivating forces in their lives. Innovators from such diverse disciplines as education, film, social services, law, business, and art will join with psychoanalysts in this ongoing community discussion series to examine the role of creativity in their lives and in their work. We're very pleased to offer this local series to the international community through the Internet, and we'll post notices at the Carter Jenkins Center's website for upcoming programs that you can view sometimes even as live webcasts. Our first event of the series was facilitated by Francis Martone, a child and adult psychoanalyst, and features the work of John Ficka, a remarkable educator in Tampa who developed an award-winning alternative culinary training program called Hands-On Educational Services. The program is designed to assist learning disabled and physically disabled adults through a unique partnership with Hyatt Hotels Corporation. John Ficker received the Tampa Chamber of Commerce Small Business Leader of the Year Award in 2002, and his program has gained wide attention as a model for alternative vocational training in Florida and on a national level. This first event was coordinated with the Hillsborough County Schools Department of Exceptional Student Education and was part of a professional training day for the teachers. As you'll notice, it was held in a middle school classroom environment and was very interactive in its nature. Forty-five special education teachers attended the session and the feedback was remarkable. Many of the attendees stated that it was the best training they ever attended. In the first part of the event, John is talking with the teachers about his program and his approach to education. In the second part, teachers are engaged in an in-depth discussion facilitated by Francis Martone of a case history of a student named Lewis, a student who might benefit from such a training program. Along with John Fick and myself, Ms. Martone helps the teachers explore the developmental and environmental forces in Lewis's life. We wish to thank the Grand Hyatt Tampa Bay and the School District of Hillsborough County for their part in making this event possible. Is this cool? Yes. Um, I was uh, really honored to even be asked to participate in this series. And when they asked me um, why, you know, why they were doing this, they were setting up the structure of the series, um, they said that we we have some very interesting people in the series, um, artists, and it, it's just all, all different walks of life. People do film documentaries. And so I, I felt very honored to be asked, but they said we can do it in different formats. And we don't have to do it at the Carter Jenkins Center. We can do it anywhere we want. And I said, well, I would like to do it for Hillsborough County Schools because, and do it for teachers because I was once in your shoes. And I, I know that when I would go to these in-service trainings, I would always want to try to pick one that would not only be interesting and maybe have food, but, uh, <laughs> but also that could give me some tools to put in my toolbox to take back to my classroom to help me help my students. And so I told them, uh, let, I'm going to try to get a hold of somebody at Hillsborough County Schools, got a hold of Kathy. And um, she said, great. And then she said, Plant City. And I said, is that OK, Francis and Mike? And no problem. We'll go to Plant City, too. So I wanted to give back because Hillsborough County Schools is really what helped me get to where I am as far as educationally and professionally. And also our program, as you're going to see as I go into more detail on it, really replicates or is modeled after CBT. The concept of school to work or transition, and, and um, as, as we think we know it, is a bridge. 
to take the students from high school to the real world. We in every county, they have community-based training programs. There, they have OJT programs. They have lots of things for ESE students. But what happens is once they leave the school system, there's not a lot out there for the in-betweeners. And you know who I'm talking about, the high-functioning SLD students, EMH, EH, SED, they catch a football with one hand, they play basketball, they draw fabulous <coughs> art, but their, their book skills are low. So on paper, and in reality, they're, they're probably not going to attend a community college or a boat tech, but they're really not appropriate for supported employment either. So what I did with the help of Healthcare County Schools and Vocational Rehabilitation five years ago, um, while all the other teachers were on spring break, I went to Tallahassee and I set up a meeting with the head of Vocational Rehab. And I thought it was going to be about a 15-minute meeting. And I told them I was a former cook and that I had a degree in special ed and I wanted to start this short term because you know the length of the training is some, sometimes the big, biggest barrier. You know, we have so many students that go, I'm going to HCC, and then six months later they quit because they can't see the light at the end of a two-year tunnel. So I wanted to do something short-term, so I set up a meeting, we started talking, and it ended up being a two-hour meeting because they were very interested because we can't have too many options for our students. And they suggested, why don't you have a residential component so you can pull people from, you know, that either don't have transportation or that are from outside. And I'm writing it down and writing it down. And, and why don't you make it all inclusive? And meals are included. And da 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 da. da. And uh, so, I, with the help of VR and my experience in Hillsborough County, we developed this program. And then I finished out my contract, and then started in June, thinking that I'll do this for the summer, and if it works out, I'll stay. Well, that was in 1998, and, and um, I I miss being in the classroom. But I really enjoy the fact that I get to do what I love doing. And, and that's, I'm a teacher, a teacher by certification and a cook by trade. And I get to help people with special needs actually look into that profession. Um, I, I do that because obviously, you know, this is, this is a world of its own. ESE is. And when, you know, even when I'm talking to VR counselors, you know, they have their own language. And we have our own language, and then sometimes it kind of overlaps a little bit. We we understand, but this is we are in our own little world. And when we're talking about PI and BE and all those little acronyms we use, um, I, I just want to know where you're coming from so that I don't assume that you're all SLD teachers or you're all EMH or whatever. But we have a pretty diverse group here, um, and I just think that's uh, that's really cool. I think the more that we collaborate and learn from each other, the better. Okay, 1998, I left the school system. I, I told you, it was for the summer. And I thought, if it works out, I'll stay. If not, um, I'll go back into the school system because God knows we need EH and SED teachers. Um, I met with the Hyatt before I met with vocational rehabilitation because I knew that CBT works if you have a good partner on the employer side, and if the teacher or the monitor or supervisor, whoever, is also participating, it would not work if you dropped off the students at the door and said, see you in three hours. I also wanted to open it up for higher functioning candidates. Not just, because sometimes, uh, depending on the school you're at and the number of slots you have for CBT, they'll and, and rightfully so, like order of selection, you want to get the, the lowest functioning first and then, then include some others if you can. But I wanted to open it up to anybody with any type of disability. I had my blinders on, though. I was thinking, you know, I came from the school system. I'm thinking SLD students, EH students, maybe some high-functioning EMH. <laughs> That's about it. And I was thinking 18 to 24. Well, I had to take my blinders off. My own grandfather was blind, but I never thought I'd have a, a visually impaired student. Well, we've had probably 10 so far, and one was only, he had um, RP, and his, his, uh, he had black and white vision only. He used the cane to get to work, gets there, and he trained, and he's been employed for three years now. Um, I never thought about deaf students. 
Okay, because I never had never had a lot of experience with them. We started getting field trips from Florida School for the Deaf and Blind would come to Tampa to see our training program, and so we started getting more and more deaf students. So many that I had to go back to HCC to learn sign to be able to communicate with them because everyone knows when you're either reprimanding or congratulating, reinforcing, way to go. The last thing you want to do is postpone that. And with interpreters, sometimes you got to wait two days, and then you got to pay them for two hours, even if they work for five minutes. Okay, and the state—it's a state-funded program, so I didn't—I didn't like that. So I went back to school so that I could say, "Why are you late again? Go back to work right now. Do you understand? You know, I wanted to be able to at least communicate enough, or to say, you know, congratulations. I'm, I'm very—I'm very proud of you. You know, and you know, you're doing a, you know, a very good job. You know, I wanted to be able to, to give them that reinforcement or the reprimand quickly. We do that in, in, kind of naturally in our classrooms because we're, we're it, right? You know, we have 10, 15 students or maybe more if you're an SLD student, an SLD teacher. Um, but we need to have that. So I had to take my blinders off. Now, most of our students are 18 to 25, and we get a lot from the... Um, that are referred to vocational rehab through the school system. Now, do you raise your hand if you know that vocational rehab is supposed to? I mean, they have school to work counselors that work in the high schools. Raise your hand if you know that. They have, just like you have transition department that works in the school system, <laughs> and CBT programs and placement and all that, you have school to work counselors that are working for the state that come into the high schools like military recruiters. And what they're doing is working with the transition department in the school districts to identify who could benefit from vocational rehab services or division of line services. Okay? And by doing that at an early, hopefully, in their junior or senior year, you can set them up so that they, they, they can be in plan right when they leave school. You have IEPs in the school system, and then they turn into IPEs. Individual plan for employment with vocational rehabilitation. The informed choice is all still in, embedded in it. Um, it. The only difference is most of them are over 18, and their parents don't have to be involved as much. You know, we know that we want to get the families and parents and boyfriends, girlfriends, you know, husbands involved as much as possible, but they don't have to be because they're over 18. So. Got with Hyatt, and I went to the chef at the one Hyatt that that I was familiar with, and I told him about this idea, to have this short-term training program to and teach them hands-on. And he's from Austria, and I, I was being real careful explaining the population or describing the population because you don't want to scare employers off. You know, when you're going out and soliciting. You know, marketing this CBT program to a new employer like Target or uh, we were at Shriners one time, and I know there's lots of other employers you use. You have to be careful because you don't want to scare them off. Oh my God, are they going to get hurt? They're going to liability, liability, liability. And so I was describing it to the to the chef, and he said, uh, "Don't worry, my daughter's an SLD of sickles. I know exactly what you're talking about." And I said. <laughs> so then we, because you know, you have to have receptive partners. We went up to the general manager's office to get his blessing, and I was trying to dance around, you know, the, you know, disabled but not, but higher functioning. How to describe it? He said, "Don't worry, my son was severely dyslexic all the way through school. He could have used something like this." When do you want to start? And I said, "Well, do you have to like get permission from the corporate office in Chicago or something?" He goes, no, this is my damn hotel. I can do whatever I want. What do you want to start? <laughs> and so there again, I was like, there is a God. There is a God. And so we started in June with two students. And we haven't turned back. We haven't looked back. We expanded to the Hyatt downtown a year later. The following year, we expanded to the Hyatt Orlando. And the, this past year, we, we expanded to the Hyatt Regency Grand Cypress in Orlando, which is right by Lake Buena Vista. So four-star property. I mean, it's it's incredible. And the reason I asked Hyatt first, and we're really fortunate to have them, is that they're at the top of the ladder. They're the Mac Daddy. 
I know that's old school, but you know, they've got new terms now. Um, that's what I miss about hanging out with the EH kids. Because they teach you all those what's hip, you know? I, I remember I, I remember it. I was my first job was at Sixteenth Street Middle School in St. Pete, and it was during the riots. Remember back in ninety five, I think, they had the riots. Our school was right in that neighborhood. And I called up that morning and you know, there were building burning by our school. I said, Are we having school today? And they said, Yeah, we're having school. Come on down. Uh, is it safe? No, I'm looking, I'm white, I'm, oh my god, you know. Um, but you know what? It was the best thing that we could have done. Because if we could shut the neighborhood down, it would have lasted a lot longer. Instead, you know, it, we just acted like nothing was going on. We in, in my classroom, we did a lot of processing. You know, hey, what, what really happened? And I remember sitting, um, a, a, sitting down behind a table and told one of the students who had said, that cop was wrong. And I said, well, you go up in front of my car, and I was sitting behind the table, and I said, you point your gun at me in my front window because my sides are tinted, and you, and you just you point your gun and yell at me to get out. And he did, and I pushed the table. And he went. And I said... Could it, how could it have happened? You know, he didn't know if he was going to keep going. Could have been just the jolt that made him shoot. But he was aimed on the guy, told him to get out. But anyway, it was a nice processing. And, it, and I learned a lot from the students. Um, when you're doing this type of program, as you know, anybody that's worked with OJT programs, you have to have good partners, and you have to listen from everybody that's you know, everybody has to contribute. So, we, like I said, we started in 98. Now we're, we did one class at the Hyatt in Miami as well. Um, just one, it was a one-time, let's take four students. We limit it to four per class. And we do two, uh, they last two weeks. And so there would be two classes a, a month. So that's eight people in Tampa a month. And then same thing in Orlando. So we can do about 16 people a month. Because we have a residential component, we actually put them up in a hotel. They have um, their meals are provided, their transportation is provided. All they got to do is get to town. And even the local kids, I recommend to the VR counselors to put them up in the hotel as well, because a lot of them have never been away from home before. So they're able to work on their independent living skills, their confidence. I love it. Parents say, "Well, my son has a hard time getting up in the morning." I said, "Not my program. He won't." One time, maybe, because I got some military time too, so I, I go go to the drill sergeant every once in a while. But it's reality to the max. They have to get up on their own. We do have some rules. They have a curfew every night at ten o'clock. It's not. I say it's not prison, but I'm not. You're not going to have so much fun. You're going to get in trouble. They're not allowed to have alcohol in the room. Obviously, drugs and all that. And we have to kick a few out for breaking the rules. They sign an agreement, and I remind them they're over eighteen. So I show them on the first day, you sign this, the girls aren't allowed in the boys' room, boys aren't allowed in the girls' room. Okay? You know, we come up with these rules for a reason, because we want you to be focused on the training. But it's really neat that when they get there, they're kind of nervous. They get a roommate, by the way, and that's always guys in one room and girls in another. Um, and when they're going through the program, they're responsible for getting up on their own. Get, we teach them how to go get in the van and go to work. They clock in and out. And the cool part is Height decided to pay them. So unlike CBT, it's a little one more step more towards reality. So they clock in and out. They get paid like everybody else. It's only minimum wage during the two weeks of training. But what better way to motivate a 19-year-old LD kid than to pay them? Also, too, your expectations can be higher. Because you're just standing around. Chef's paying you. What are you standing around for? If you got time to lean, you got time to clean. You, got, you know, let's go. Chef, chef looks at you, and you're not working. All he hears is change, change, change. You're you're costing him money, or her money. So they they come to town for two weeks. The first we always started on a Sunday, because that's a good travel day with no traffic. And so they come to town. I meet with them, with one other person, and we do orientation here, and we have them sign that agreement. And we give them their meal coupons for the hotel they live in. In Tampa, it's the Park Plaza Hotel, uh, right by West Shore Plaza, which is really nice because on their off time, they can walk over to the mall, the food court, the movies, and all that. 
Um, but all their meals are provided. And then the second day, on Monday, um, the first real working or training day is in a classroom with myself and two other instructors. And we have four people. We have almost as many instructors as we have students. And what we do is we go over, uh, we start off with employability skills because it's attitude is everything and it's the most important. And I, I'll quote myself, you can be the best chef in the world, but if your attitude sucks, you ain't staying. And I'm straight up with them, and I believe that if you start with that and then infuse it throughout the program and beat on that, you know, yeah, you're on time. But look at the way you're standing. You know? I didn't say nothing. No, you said a million words with just your posture. You're nothing out here, man. So we, did, we, we infuse a lot of employability skills, attitudes, everything. We also teach them... Um, uh, disease prevention, and they get a food handler certification from the state, which is good for three years. Anybody that works in food um, is required to have this training. It's not pass or fail. They just have to be alive and participate during this two-hour training. Like you guys. That's all you got to do to get your six <laughs> Just be alive. Um, so we do that, and we also um, uh, go through safety, um, the equipment, we actually bring the equipment in, see it, touch it, feel it type stuff. It's a sheet pan, see it flat like a sheet of paper. Because you know that a lot of our LD students are visual learners and auditory. It's, it's not a lot of paperwork. And I tell them right off the bat, we're going to take some quizzes. And they go, Ugh. but they're not pass fail. Yes. <laughs> and then their, their anxiety is reduced and they participate. We also uh, go through what the different departments and different area. Um, types of people you can be working. What's a sous chef? What's a chef tournant? What is garmage? You know, these are words that are foreign to most people and we, they have to know it. So on that second day when they're thrown in with the wolves that the chef says, go over to garmage and get me some tomatoes. They'll know garmage, garmage, cold food, cold food. Okay, all right. And they're going that way because we teach them that the first day. And then we end the day by teaching them knife handling skills and we bring a chef in. Um, although I'm a pretty good cook, um, and I can do it when the chef doesn't show. It, it, it always is more um, impactful if, if the chef attends, and he usually does. Or she. Sometimes they have one of the other sous chefs. That's female, which is really cool for the girls, because then they look up and they go, wow, you look on TV and they're all men. You know, no. And, and at the Grand Hyatt Tampa Bay, most of the sous chefs, or I'd say half of them are female. Okay. Um, and we teach them knife handling skills, and VR actually purchases them a set of knives. It's about a $100 set of knives. And we teach them how to use them, and they get to keep them not only in the training, but then when they, when they graduate. And then when they graduate, they get a certificate that says they've completed a 100-hour vocational training course in the area of culinary arts. It's got the Hyatt logo on there, and it's got the chef's signature. And this executive chef supervises a hotel that does about $20 million a year in food and beverage. Very well known. It's a very tight-knit community. Chefs in Florida know each other more than teachers. Like, how many people you know in Dade County School? You don't know that, you know, you might know one. But chefs, they know each other because they all, they're all in hot competition. And so it's signed, so they leave the program with those two certificates, a set of knives, and they're willing and ready to work in an entry level position. I'm going to show you a quick uh, video so you can get a better visual. <laughs> Some students who don't do well in a traditional classroom may have physical or emotional disabilities. They want to succeed, but need a little help. Tonight's End News Education reporter is about Mascarenhas. Takes a look at a program that has helped more than 300 students. Eric St. John often depends on his eyes to learn a new skill. Like the 19-year-old gives it a try. Great. Very Just like the directions, Eric didn't hear the compliment. He's deaf. A disability that may keep others from fulfilling a dream drives Eric to realizing his of becoming a chef. I plan to be cooking my life. Eric is on his way with the help of a two-week, 100-hour culinary training course called Hands-On Educational Services. It's real world. You learn with your hands. The Grand Hyatt Tampa Bay Hotel trains the students. They become temporary employees, getting paid while they attend class. It's education. It's great. I'm making sure that I'm learning everything and... It's fantastic, and then later, when I'm done with this, I'll be able to be professional, you know? It's wonderful. Eric shares his excitement with Jessica Mattis. What's your favorite thing here to do? My favorite? I like cutting. The 
former hands-on student, has been working at the Hyatt's five-star restaurant Armani's since she graduated a year and a half ago. Now she helps train students like Eric. Well, in the first place, it inspires me. You know, to work here, this program, and now to be able to give back to them. I feel proud because I'm giving them hope. So are former students, now Hyatt employees like 1999 alumni Richard Staff and last year's grad Jeff Spencer. Eric, St. John. They've all overcome any challenges and paved a road to success. In Tampa, Isabel Mascarenas, Tampa Bay's 10 News. What a cool program. I'll be proud of you. The program is sponsored by Florida's Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And that last little comment is sponsored by Florida's Division of Vocational that's the even win, 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 win part of it. The students not to pay. So they go to the program, they get paid while they're there, they get the training, they get the equipment, the certificates, and we've had a lot of success with them getting jobs. The only ones that are struggling, either in very rural communities in our state, where they, there's not a whole lot of opportunity, or maybe they, their disability um, uh, is more severe or uh, you know, there are some students we've had that were very low uh, reading and writing skills and they struggle with their own applications. VR will help them with a job coach once they graduated our program. So they get some assistance um, there as well. The one young man that you saw chopping, he was an SLD student from um, Nellis County and he graduated about two years ago and he's been working there ever since. The Hyatt's not obligated to hire any of our graduates, but it's a two week working interview. And I tell them all that if they have an opening, they might be looking at you. They've hired about 25 of our graduates over a five-year period. And uh, at the Grand Hyatt, I think there's about seven or eight still working there. One was in our second class. He was an SLD student from Hernando County on Ritalin, came to the program. Um, he was working in sheet metal part-time up there. And he came to our program, the Hyatt saw his potential because, you know, ADHD, I, if I could write a book about ADHD, I'd call it deficit to asset. Because in school it's a deficit because you need to sit down and be quiet. Well, it's hard for ADHD kids to do that. But on the job, here's, here's James at work. Okay, finish with that, Chef. What else do you want me to do? The chef's going, oh, go get me two more just like <laughs> Because he wants to keep going. Okay? Um, We've had, uh, obviously, Jessica uh, is deaf, and she's been wor working there a year and a half, and so our trainees become teachers. That is really cool. And because they work for Hyatt, I get to keep an eye on them. So I get to ask the supervisors how they're doing, and I get to, I, I, almost like job coaching, but it's because I, I develop a longer-term relationship with them. Jessica, after she graduated, was working full-time at night in Armani's, which is the four-star Italian restaurant at the top. And she kept bugging me. You got any work for me to do in your office? I, I'm bored during the day. And um, and so finally I gave her one mail-out project, and that was a year and a half ago, and she's been an employee of ours for a year and a half now. Part-time. She's got keys to our office. She has a box. She um, has her mom's picture. She's got it on the desk, you know? <laughs> and, and she comes in at night or whenever she wants to, and whatever's in her box, she takes care of it. If people need applications or whatever, I say, no problem. I write their name and address down, stick it in her box. She knows what to do. Um, she helps with the graduations, and especially when we have deaf classes, um, where we have deaf students, she comes in and she'll take a day off of work of her full-time job and come in and, and work with us. And who better to explain, you know, than a, than a graduate of the program, right? right. Um, I'm going to show you, remember I said I had blinders on? Well, you got a quick glimpse of Richard Sab in there. I want to show you a quick video of Richard. Um, remember I said 1825? Well, our oldest was 73. Richard was our oldest. He's, he was 49 when he came through our program. Um, here's his quick story. 49 years old, working 20 years at Campbell Soups in Maryland, making Swanson TV dinners. He took 20 years, benefits, the works. He's driving to work one day, gets in the parking lot, has a pain in his back and his stomach, his legs go numb. And he's going, what the hell's going on? He calls for his friends walking by in the parking lot. They take him to the hospital. He has this rare blood clot. He said, the doctor told him, one in so many million people. He goes, thank you. I'm that lucky. And he, they removed the blood clot, but he remained paralyzed from the waist down. 
A year later, his wife was diagnosed with cancer and she passed away in three months. He moves to Florida, moves in with his um, sister and brother-in-law, and his teenage daughter moves in with his oldest daughter um, in St. Pete because he felt like he really couldn't take care of her. And he's feeling, you know, like anybody that loses, you know, your, your legs and loses your spouse. I mean, he was going through lots of loss, and he went through the depression and anger and all those stages. And finally, he went to vocational rehab and said, I'm tired of watching cars go by. And his VR counselor in Brayton said, well, what do you want to do? So I want to be a cook again. She goes, okay. And she called me, and I, I'm pretty open-minded, but I was thinking, the tables are high. How is he going to do it in a wheelchair? And, and I was doing like a lot of employers do. I was creating the barriers. Uh, what about this? What about that? Will it be safe? Da, 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 da. And she said, well, they make this chair that stands you up. And I said, why don't you come, bring them, bring that chair. Let's see if we can find a place to put it. I talked to the chef. He said, hey, let's give him a shot, see what he can do. Well, he graduated the program. At first, he could only stand in the chair for four hours at a time. That was in 99. And they hired him. Um, Vision of Vocational Rehab helped him relocate to Tampa. He's been living here right down the street from me. We've become good friends now because, you know, we geographically, I, well, I'm close to him at home, and also I see him all the time at work. Well, his story got back to somebody in Atlanta who works for the federal government that funds these programs, and she's in a wheelchair, and she had met Richard. And she contacted Georgia Tech University because Georgia Tech got a grant to do case studies, documentaries, to use for training throughout the country to get VR counselors to think outside the box. And so this was just a small little clip uh, like a two and a half minute clip of that documentary, but the, the the official or formal one is ten and a half minutes long, and they're pitching it now to PBS and to Oprah and all these other national shows. Talk about inspirational. Richard inspires not only the, the people, you know, his family and friends and stuff, he inspires people he works with. If you have a cold or something, you walk in and see Richard work and you go, and if he can do it, I can do it. Richard performs here in our hotel as a Garmin J cook. Basically, he works within the Garmin J department, which is primarily cold food prep. Richard does a lot of the prep work for many of the daily recipes that happen day in and day out, as well as the banquets that we have. When I first approached the chef about Richard... I'm really not that heavy. Any questions? Chance. Let's see what he can do, and that—that's a key component. You know, in rehab, you know, our private industry um, partners are very important because you know, that's where they're going to end up. And he has a terrific personality, so every person that meets him likes him. It makes it a lot easier. You know, um, he doesn't expect to be treated any differently. He came with the intention of working just as hard as everyone else in that program. You know, I think Richard said it. He said. Uh, I don't consider myself disabled. I just can't walk. <laughs> That's it. I just love having a job here. And I love accomplishing what I've done so far. I love it. I love that. I love the people. I mean, it's something exciting every day. Something new to talk about. Yeah. It's just fun. I just can't wait to get here in the mornings. The chair itself is incredible to me because of its simplistic nature. It's not electric. It's it's a wheelchair that stands you up and then he propels himself. He walks around like everybody else. So what it did is it removed that barrier. We have several employee recognition programs and one of them is an all-star team. And Richard was a, a real no-brainer when it came to uh, nominating him for the All-Star team in June of 2000. His recognition was for what he accomplishes in a boy, just like anybody else. Whether it's showing up to work on time and coming in with a good attitude and doing a good job and, 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 and exemplifying the teamwork and the spirit that we want with, with all our... I, I wanted just to back up just for a second to show you something. The only two accommodations that the hotel made for him, or the main two, was they built him this box 
that lifts his cutting boards up because he stands higher. And then the engineering department said, you need to carry your tools and stuff, and he can't carry anything when he's walking. So they built him this box that hangs over. That, that was their major accommodations that they made for the kids. And, and, and exemplifying the teamwork and the spirit that we want with, with all of our Hyatt family members and cooperation with getting things done and showing flexibility and adapting to change because in the kitchen there's a lot of change and a lot of things going on. And being able to meet the expectations of the supervisor or exceed them. He was recognized for that award for the same reasons every other employee was. If you're in a position where you're disabled, uh, a lot of people just give up. And give up. But if you keep a positive attitude, you know, positive emotion, you keep that, just go ahead on and use your head. Think. Be positive. Don't, you know, never think negative. So that's what I would tell everybody. Just like that. Tell them that. Be a positive person. That's, that's what I am. Positive. And the, the comprehensive um, case study that, or the documentary they did is ten and a half minutes long, and then it goes more into detail about the chair of the manufacturer that, because they're using it for training throughout the country. Uh, but uh, hopefully they'll, they'll get it up on PBS too. And I wanted to show that because that's the title of the Charter Jacobs Center series of inspiring minds. And we're all inspired by people like Richard. We're inspired by teachers, special teachers we had maybe, or a family member, or um, a spouse. Somebody encouraged all of us to, to be where we're at. And when they asked me to participate, I wanted to present to ESE teachers because we're constantly, or generally, just sitting in class watching these students, and we see that their academics are lo low on this side, or maybe they're higher on this one, or maybe they're both low. Um, but like I said, they're catching football and playing basketball, um, and you just know that there's more potential there. And sometimes you're, you know, you, you, you're seeking, what is it about this person? And we have to, whenever I, whenever I talk to my students on the first day, I always write down the word, I hope this is dry erase. Um, <laughs> you want to make an LD kid laugh, man. Use a permanent marker on a board and then you... <laughs> I always... I know it's hard to see everybody. I'll go back and forth. I always write the word disability down and I say in school, isn't it negative when they say, don't diss me? Why are you dissing me, man? Right? Diss me is short for disrespect. Okay? So I say, well, take out the negative stuff. Take out the this. And look at most of the word is ability. Focus on your abilities. Focus on your strengths and what you can do. We all know what you can. You've already proven that to us by numerous tests and FCATs and all that garbage. But show me what you can do. Let's focus on that. And when I, when I see Richard and I see Jessica and Eric and and uh, Jeff um, and Tara, I, I, I'm inspired by them. And I want, I want you to be inspired by them, and then I want you to inspire the people that you, that you affect. Yes, Peter. Well, what, what's the big possibilities of having an institute that kids who are like that, who catch or cook, and have a, sort of a college or a high school or a program that they can stay there and hire teachers who want to be you know, in the school setting with them. Uh, like, in other words, like at a high school, vocational school kind of thing for right. ESE so, students? Right, and, and, and they live there, and then they function, and they play other This is spring break. <laughs> You're, we're going to choose you. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Just like I did back in 95. This time it's your turn. Okay, because we have kids in our school that... Uh, I invited the high school coach at Milton to come up. This kid, he, he reminds me when I first got here, I put a kid um, at, at uh, Tampa Bay Tech. Uh, but 
he, he signed a $38 million contract with Buffalo, and he was an SLP kid. And this kid is 254 pounds, big as all get out, and the coach wanted to get in the ninth grade next year. And it, uh, his name was Ted Washington. And he's number 92 now, I think, for uh, the 49ers. He went to the University of Cincinnati. So we're going to kick his butt this week. So how much time we're going to vote against Ted. This week, in fact. But, but it's, those, it's those students that yeah, you're describing, yeah. mm -hmm. and we all see them in our classrooms. We, we, we just know that they've got more going on in there. Maybe they can't get it out here. Maybe they can't write about it. But you just know it. And, and I had one kid, his father was a mechanic, and he, wrote, he read, read, he was an eighth grader, but he was reading on a, about a second grade level. And he was an EH student, but he was really... Uh, prop, I, I'm not sure if he was an EMH, but I was working with this alternative program in St. Pete where for all the ESC kids who've been expelled, you know, you really can't expel an ESC student because it's a manifestation of their disability. So they put them in an alternative program. And that's where I really freaked out. I came in thinking because it's a behavioral type program, they wanted EH types. And I came in and all my students were SLD or EMH because they had... Um, brought weapons to school or had a teacher or whatever, you know. And so here I was at P Tech South in St. Pete. Um, but this one kid read up read on a second grade level and so I couldn't give him the regular spelling words and assignments. So I told him, Go get a manual from your father. Anyone, any car manual, and he brought it to class. And I said, Alright, we're here's here's your spelling words for this week. And you know that a kid could spell carburetor? I can't spell carburetor. <laughs> but he could spell carburetor. And that was one of his spelling words one week. Or, and and then, then we'd do other assignments, like I would say you have to um, go to page, because some of those manuals are very fine print, and you have to find the phrase da da da. And I would try to do it and, and speak and time him and stuff. And he would, like, all right, it was like a game to him. But he was very interested in that manual because his father was a mechanic and he played it around. So you've got to find those things that they're interested in because they're, our behaviors are very interest driven. Right? And you know, I, I'm not a book learner. I've read one book in my adult life that I did not have to read for college. And that's because I was in the Coast Guard stuck in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba for two days waiting for a plane to come get me. And there was nothing to do. <laughs> and I picked up a book. I still remember the name of it because it's the only one I've ever read. And it was called The Island by Peter Benchley. And the guy that wrote Jaws. And I read it from cover to cover. But I hate reading. Because I, I fall asleep. If I want to fall asleep, just pick it. But if it's interesting to me, I'll read it all day long. I'll read the sports page all day long. I'm a huge Bucks fan. And I, I'll read about them in every little detail. Same with our kids. You've got to find what they're interested in, what's driving them, and then go from there. With that, I want to introduce Tara Giglio because she graduated her program last June, right out of high school, SLD student. And I found out on our drive here that Tara was also ADHD, and I'd have never known it because she's Miss Lovely. Um, and she, she was on Ritalin for a short period of time. And yesterday, she, well, actually this week, I asked her to come to help me with the food, and I wanted to introduce her, show an example of type of students that were, that were assisting. And um, to give you a little background on her, she was referred, she came right after she graduated, she started our program, she didn't want to wait and party all summer, she wanted to get in there. She graduated our program, the Hyatt had a part-time job opening. Now, she had been in CBT up in Pasco County, and had worked at a couple locations, and um, at first, non-paid, and then, then she started getting paid. And her last job was at cash and carrying, and she knew she wanted to be in the food, but they she was their best cleaner. And so what do, what do bad managers do? They don't promote their best dishwasher or best cleaner, because if I do, then who's going to do what they've been doing? They're always on time. They always do whatever. So she went around the whole store and kept the place looking at it. So they didn't give her much opportunity, even though you were there how long? Almost a year. Almost a year. Came to our program, she graduated, did a good job, caught high at time, and the sous chef at this one restaurant said, I have a part-time position, I'd really like to offer her a job. And Tara took it. She
she, she talked to me first and we talked about the possibilities because, you know, she could work full time and she wanted full time with benefits. But I told her this could be your foot in the door with a four star hotel. Well, I think you were part time, what, six months? And then they moved her into full time. So for the last year, she has benefits. Um, here's how good their benefits are at Hyatt. For an entire family, your out of pocket for health insurance is $92 a month. Oh my God. Out of pocket. I, it, when I was in health insurance, it was like 270 or something. 600. 600. Oh, gosh. Well, we won't go there because you're all going to get depressed. <laughs> but she's got it. What's it, Dr. Leonard? Dr. Leonard? You got it by Come and get her now. She said, piss off. <laughs> I hate to stray and I hate to talk, as you can see, but I'm going to stray for a second. Can you just remind me, when I was teaching E self contained, um, whenever the students would curse at me, and I know I, I probably walked a fine line as far as barriers, you know, and uh, I, but whenever they cursed at me, it was my green light and John Ficka's mind to be able to use profanity because we're not supposed to curse. So when a person would say pissed off or sometimes they would say, F you or whatever, right? Yeah. As soon as they would say it, I'd go, did she just say fuck you? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I heard fuck you. I heard fuck you. She's a big girl. Did anybody hear her say fuck you? And she would, the kids would, would start laughing, and then she'd start laughing, and then suddenly, because she that wasn't why she said it, to get everybody to laugh. She wanted the, the attention of everybody. She wanted everybody to say, the best I was there was death. That's way old. Way. But anyway, back to Tara, who has never said that. Um, but what was really cool is when she said, yeah, I'll go. She doesn't have to work till 2 today. So I told her boss that we might be a couple minutes late. And they said, fine. Because I'm not going to be there until tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I thought it was cool that she was going to come. And I wanted her to just say a few words. And, and that way, when we open for questions, you can ask her questions, too. Well, yesterday, I'm getting in my car, and she's going to work. And she sees me. She goes, John, John. And she hands me several copies of her Vokey Val. I said, what is this? And she goes, well, if we're going to see teachers, since I was a former SLC student, I think they should see what my scores were in high school. And I said, you don't mind sharing that? And she goes, no. And so I blackened out her last name and her social, and I'm going to give that to you on your break. Um, that, this is a kid, a young lady now. When would we be 20, 21? 20 in December. You still can't drink. Um, but here's a, a young person who, if you looked at her QM folder, you know, you would think, third, fourth grade level, what's she going to do? She's destined for fast food or whatever. She's been working at a four-star hotel. She's not making a mint yet, but she gets paid a decent competitive salary, and she's got room to move up. And the kid that graduated from Hernando County five years ago, who's, who works at her restaurant, has moved up. There's cook one, cook two, cook three, cook four, lead cook, sous chef, who's in charge of the department. James is now a cook three, about to make cook four, and he almost makes 12 bucks an hour. Not bad for an LD kid who's not even taking his riddle anymore. Okay. And gives her hope, because she knows she could do just like James. She has the same potential. College is college, but work is school. Right? I didn't learn how to be a ESE teacher at USF. I learned it at 16th Street Middle School walking in my first year and her saying, fuck you. <laughs> that's, that's, where, that's where you learn how to be an EH teacher or an LD teacher or whatever. You learn by just being there. Work at school. And so she knows that she's, continu she's continually going to school now. And in this industry, 
It's not only very forgiving, it doesn't matter even if you went to school. Most of the sous chefs, 65, 70% of the sous chefs, who are making 25 to 50,000 a year, never went to culinary school. And many of them never graduated high school. And so what we're doing is we're exposing young people like Tara to this industry that, I mean, I can really move up, I can do that, and it gives them hope. Tara, really real quickly, just tell them what you do at Hyatt, where you work, and what kind of things you do. Well, I work at the Grand Hyatt Tampa Bay. Um, I work in pantry. I cut food. I prep it. I do mostly salads, sandwiches, and I grill sometimes. Um, just plain old cooking, prepping, doing what I wanted to do. Some teachers looked at me and said, you know what? I don't think you're going to be able to do this because I'm reading fourth grade. Spelling, horrible. English, crazy. <laughs> so I was just like, just barely making it out of school. And, you know, they looked at me, I looked at myself, I was like, well, I'm going to be cleaning floors for the rest of my life. It's not what I wanted to do, ever. But uh, thanks for John's, you know, school. <laughs> um, Motivation. I know. John's school, you know, it's giving me hope that I can do what I want to do, not what other people say I can do and can't do. And without his show, I mean, I'd probably be still a cashier carry, scrubbing the floor, sweeping the floor, doing whatever they ask. It just wouldn't get any life. I'd be there for my, own, my entire life. But thanks for the program and everything. You didn't have to say that. What How do you refer a person to this program? Um, if you, well, uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to work in a high school, obviously. You could just write these two numbers down in Tampa. Um, and one is the area office. And so if you live in an outlet uh, like Zephyr Hills or Plant City or whatever, they can give you the number to the local. Vocational rehabilitation. In their area office is 813-233-3600. If you have a person that, and, and we're not just talking about our program, we're talking about a person that could, they want to go to school, they want to, to a traditional college, but they have a disability. Um, they contact them, become eligible for their services, it's free to the client, it's a state funded program that's federally driven, grant driven, and um, they'll determine their eligibility, put them in an IPE, Individual Plan for Employment, and then determine with the help of the client what he's interested in, They'll, they'll send them out for psyche valves, work evals. Um, they'll send them to counseling if they need mental health counseling. They'll pay for medications. Basically, they're trying to stabilize the client if they need to, to get to work. Their job is to obtain and maintain employment, gainful employment. You interview these clients before you... Well, what happens is they go to VR, and a lot of them right. are referred through the transition counselors in the school system. Right. And then they, they get referred to the VR counselors and then when they leave the school system, the cool thing is they don't have to have a regular diploma, special diploma. They can they can drop out and still qualify for these services. It has nothing to do with their academics. You've never turned anybody down. Um, I've turned down a couple, and, and in our program, the qualifications are you got to be 18, is required by the industry, and um, you have to be drug free. We don't want you to come to this program for two weeks. And you got a, uh, you have a substance abuse problem, and then we're trying to help you get a job, and everybody drug screens. Well, they get referred to us by vocational rehab. They've already done all that with the school systems documentation and VR's extra documentation. They've already they've already had that. Yeah, we have about a three month waiting list to get our culinary permit. Um, <laughs> Two days before graduation, he had called me and he goes, Sarah, uh, we have an opening on Sunday if you want to come right after graduation. Of course, I was going to have this huge party. I mean, you're talking about a normal teenage thing, big cake, lots of balloons, big okay. party. I made black and white copies because I didn't have enough color ones. Um, this is one of the items I'm going to give you on your break to look over and you can take home. This was done by Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU, out of Richmond, Virginia. They found out about our program. 
and uh, they had a Dr. Brian McMahon came to town, did a case study, and this is a picture of Tara on the top here. And it's, they were choosing 25 of the top employers in the country that are working with people with disabilities. And these case studies are going to all the major chamber of commerce all over the country. 